issue of blight in Evansville neighborhoods is a hot political topic today. Abandoned homes too often become the targets of vandalism and arson, bringing down the value of neighboring homes. This is not the first time in our city's history that there has been concern about blighted properties. In the 1950s, the West Side Nut Club led an early effort to clean up the city's appearance. Well, I think it was uh, about threefold. One was uh, the unsightliness of the uh, shanties and the uh, houseboats on the creek, but also there was a, a lot of, uh, they said there was a lot of disease and, uh, and uh, problems with the police and things like that uh, down there. And the third reason is that they were going to build the, uh, or had, was getting approved the uh, uh, overpasses over the Columbia Delaware over, overpass and also the, uh, uh, which was Division Street at that time, but the overpass, uh, they called it the West Side overpass, uh, that were built in the, in the uh, middle 50s. So they wanted to have a clean creek bank for the people coming through town to uh, look down on the creek and not see all the uh, blight that was down there. During the 1900s, the city began to notice that people had started to live on the Ohio River. It was estimated that people had been living on Pigeon Creek in homemade houseboats calling shanties since the late 1800s. In 1907, the city would outlaw people from living on Pigeon Creek, but the city never truly enforced this law. Everybody drank out of the same bucket. They had a bucket of water in the kitchen with a dipper and everybody drunk out of that bucket. How we didn't get sick, I don't know. It makes me sick to think about it. My mother would get up early in the morning and uh, take an old stove and put wood in it and coal, heat it up, and she'd cook us a big breakfast every morning, always gravy, homemade biscuits, and eggs. After that, she would put on her beans because you had beans every day, seven days a week. You would have chicken on Sundays, but you still had beans. It was called a filler food. Everybody had to eat. Oh, and they bought them by the 100 pound bags. And the neighbors would trade each other, like northern beans for pinto beans, cup by cup, they would trade. They bought their flour and sugar and gray big bags, and they took the bags from the flour and made us some clothes out of it, out of the bags. Whenever the city attempted to enforce the law, the people would either return to their shanties after they had been cleared out, or the people would be unable to leave due to the weather. In 1933, the city made a large push to clear the creek. However, the creek waters were flooded and it was impossible for the people on the shanties to get under the bridge. The shanties were safe for a bit longer. That would change, however, in 1957. In 1957, the Nut Club began to pressure the city to help them clear out what had become known as Shantytown. The Nut Club had been wanting to clean up Pigeon Creek since the end of World War II, but they had never been able to accomplish it. The Nut Club had made a push to clear out the creek five years earlier, but had been unable to complete the task due to complications with the sewage system. On February 15, 1957, Mayor Hartke announced that he was meeting with the Nut Club to discuss clearing out the creek. Later that day, he declared that Shantytown would be cleared out by the end of summer. On March 14th of 1957, the paper published the city's plans for clearing the creek. The police would issue eviction notices, which would tell the residents to be out of their shanties by April 30th. Then the city would take a survey of Shantytown to determine how many people lived there so they could determine what to do with them once the shanties were gone. For the low income, they planned to find housing. After everyone was cleared out, they planned to demolish and raise the shanties. Then the city would clean up and beautify the area. The reaction to the coming destruction of Shantytown was mixed by its residents. Many of the residents had lived there for many years and did not know what they would do once they were forced to leave. Many said they planned on heading to Kentucky as soon as they were forced out. When Mayor Hartke visited to see the progress of those moving out, one elderly man told Mayor Hartke that he had voted for him and had lived there for the past 24 years clearly disappointed with the mayor for kicking him out. Each case was different, with some men upset to be leaving their homes, while others were relieved to leave at the promise of better housing. The one lady that I talked to lived across the, the river for a couple years, and then she actually had uh, their boat towed down to Spotsville, so that was one of the people that liked that lifestyle and wanted to live there. One woman even produced a receipt and claimed that she had paid the city to allow her to live on Pigeon Creek. Whether this is true or not is unknown, but it does demonstrate the mixed reactions of those being forced to leave. There were arguments between those living in the city on what they should do with the people living on the creek. 
While the majority of the city saw that it was necessary to clear the creek, some applauded the people in Shantytown for living as they were. They saw it as a free-spirited, independent way of living and seemed to think that they should be left to their own devices. The majority of the city, however, agreed that those living on the shanties needed to be cleared out and helped to find better living spaces. What method they used to do this, however, was disputed. Some in the city thought it unfair that the residents of the shanties were going to get free housing even though they had not been paying taxes and following the law. The general attitude was that the people on the shanties were being rewarded for doing the wrong thing. Others did not see where they would be able to house everyone, with estimates of those being moved out at around 190 people. The city was conflicted and came to the agreement that at least the poorest of the individuals would be moved into at least temporary housing, most likely the remaining temporary housing from World War II. Uh, some of the other ones, they found apartments here or there, and there was some government housing on Ohio Street where I know a few of them uh, got into the uh, government, that housing that uh, was built during World War II for the government housing, and, that, and they got into some of those apartments there, and they uh, seemed to really think they got a real good deal out of that because they had running water and an inside bathroom and stuff like that. So uh, I'm sure a lot of them were really thrilled, but I'm sure a lot of them uh, liked that lifestyle because that might have been all they've, they've known for years. I was thrilled to death, absolutely thrilled to death. My mom moved over on Ohio Street and then later on to what we called a mud center. When we left the creek, it was probably the happiest day of my life. The only one I can remember stayed there was that lady called Maybell Eatman. She was angry because they pushed her boat off into the river, you know, clearing it out. She was really angry. Now, she'll tell you she liked it down there. She liked living on the creek. But I told her I didn't. I said, I, I like electricity and I like water. The plan began to be carried out on March 22nd of 1957. The plan was for the residents of Shantytown to have around a month to evacuate their homes. The final day was set at April 30th of 1957. The last man to leave would depart on May 3rd of 1957. However, the Nut Club would be unable to raise the buildings immediately due to a large number of rats on the shanty boats. Reluctant to let the rats into the city, the city set out rat traps to kill the rats instead of pushing them into the city with the fire. The shanties would be burned about a week later on May 11th. Today, Shantytown is nothing but memories of the people that live there and the efforts the city and the Nut Club put in to help clear the area and find the residents better homes.